Well, folks, health and safety, you know, it really affects most small businesses and um, uh, hugely, but it affects big businesses as well. And there's about a whole lot of changes going to happen. There's been some cases of interest. So who better to talk to than a practitioner, someone who's on the ground floor, someone who knows, and someone who just lives with this night and day. So we've got Matt Jones here from Advanced Safety. So welcome, Matt, and thank you for coming in. My pleasure, Max. Thanks for having me. So look, there's a couple of things in here. Um, let's first off touch on what the minister's saying. So the minister, Van Belden, is indicating that she's going to change the Health and Safety at Work Act, which must be your Bible, must be what you guided through from day to day. But to know it's changing must be quite daunting for you. Uh, yes, it, it is, Max. Um, obviously, the, the Act's been in place now since the 1st of April 2016. Um, we don't really have a great deal of case law to um, re rely on in terms of the uh, interpretation of the legislation. Um, but there is a sense that um, we could be looking at um, throwing the baby out of the bath, uh, the bath water, before really giving the, the legislation um, a, a good solid chance to, um, to be tried and tested uh, in the modern workplace. Yeah, well, I, I was noting I took particular interest of Van Der Velden uh, when um, she, uh, Brooke, I've got to call her Brooke, yeah. because uh, I do know her personally, but uh, not not very often. I haven't seen her since she's been a minister. But Brooke indicated, I saw in an interview she did, that she wants to change the whole fundamentals of the legislation. So I'd be interested in your comments. Where she's saying the legislation is really too focused on compliance for employers and mm. rather than that it's actually talking about safety for actually people enabling them to get home she's yeah. talking also matt and i like your comments on this is to focus really on principles mm. rather than details you know you must keep a list of this you must keep that and put this away and and miles and miles of documentation which mm. is put in the bottom drawer and forgotten about Absolutely. so what's your thoughts on that do you think that sounds practically uh well, it's, is it a good thing first off for employers, um, and, and next thing is it is it practical? Is it going to keep people safe and get people home to their um, to their homes easier? Yeah, so I actually feel like, and the way you've just described it is is a great way of putting it, is that um, what Brooke is proposing and what the current legislation and what the current um, uh, methods by practitioners like myself, it's actually in alignment. Um, and so it comes as a bit of a surprise that Brooke is, is putting across the position that the legislation is actually pushing businesses and PCBUs to generate a raft of posters and, and policies and procedural documents that no one ever reads. Because I believe, at least from my perspective, that the current act, the Health and Safety at Work Act 2015, is encouraging businesses to um, risk assess and critically think about what is fit for purpose for their specific business. So the language within the legislation and um, the, the, the regulatory guidelines from WorkSafe encourages businesses to think about what level of risk their business creates and what types of controls are most practical to reduce those risks. So I think what Brooke is um, uh, striving or aiming for is actually pretty much what the Act and what people like myself are actually trying to achieve. So I do wonder whether she needs to spend a little bit more time talking to those on the ground and spending more time talking to businesses, both who are struggling, but also who are excelling in the um, in the implementation of the legislation. So Matt, the, the act itself, I mean, really, it, it is quite concerning for me that, for instance, 2016, there's been very little um, mm. legal issues taken. Yes. Um, but also uh, WorkSafe, who are the policemen of the of the uh, whole regime, are criticised for doing nothing and yeah. sitting back on their hands because their prosecutions have become less and less. Mm. And in the meantime, deaths are coming up higher and higher. So yes. the, the question is, is, is the new legislation working? Well, the new, it's 2016, which is what... Um, what's that for? Eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really working. It perhaps, mm -hmm. and what she's saying is that we ought to have something that's more simpler. Mm -hmm. Now, just my years when I was doing health and safety, what I remember is the documentation was just massive. And that yeah. was way back in time before this piece of law we got now. Mm -hmm. um, and look, you've just told us that, hey, that's been lessened to a whole degree, which is heartening mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But the other factor is her point really is, is this still requires a lot of compliance 
for mm. employers hours and hours and hours of work, which may not result in saving lives. Yeah. Would you concur with that or not? I I feel that we we are missing an a trick or are missing an opportunity in the interpretation and implementation of what the legislation is pushing businesses toward. So what I guess what I mean by that is if we really boil the nuts and bolts down, it doesn't really matter what the Health and Safety at Work Act actually says. What what actually really matters is the um, simplification of what the core requirements and responsibilities are of all of the various stakeholders um, involved. Unfortunately, what's happened is, just as you quite rightly mentioned, is we've got a regulator that is dysfunctional, um, that is under-resourced uh, without enough men and women on the ground helping businesses to understand what good looks like. And so as a result, it has become extremely confusing. Um, another layer that we haven't mentioned is um, the health and safety professional um, uh, bodies as well. So um, we have mentioned the regulator, we've mentioned the inspectors, but also there is a, a professional uh, group, including myself, out there who unfortunately are perhaps muddying the waters and, and confusing what what do, uh, what does good look like um because it doesn't seem that there's much agreement around that um sadly oh mm. well look i do understand that because in my world the empl employment world um when when can an employer dismiss an employee for bad mm -hmm. behavior mm -hmm. um and the test in the act is this what would a fair and reasonable employer do in the circumstances mm -hmm. so if the health and safety at work act is full of you know comments like that and that's the test well no one's going to know what it means until the courts dealt with it mm -hmm. so but there's got to be prosecutions to do that but what i'm understanding there's very very little prosecutions little action occurring mm -hmm. so i i dealt with a um an inspector for um for wins and he was frustrated on the back uh, not wins um work safe mm -hmm. and what he was frustrated with was when he took cases to his um seniors they mm -hmm. said no we're not litigating that why Mm. Why? This employee screwed up the notice in front of me, threw it on the ground, told me to get off his site. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just ignoring us. Mm. Yeah, you yeah, know, no, we we haven't um, we haven't got time or the resources. Um, we'll we're, yeah, we'll get back to you some other time. But uh, carry on with the good work. You're really doing well. And yep. the guy was just going, "Wow!" He had to retire. Yes. He had to leave in the end because of frustration. Yeah, but yep. look, we've got public servants in the way. We've mm -hmm. got. Um, <laughs> I doubt your professional organization's too much in the way, but you know, we've got to get some sort of rulings so mm -hmm. that your professional organization can give yep. advice yes. to employers and you can't. Mm -hmm. um, that's, and that's right. what Brooke's proposing is to lessen down the legislation, mm -hmm. which means we've got to rely more on the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, I think our justice system's broken personally, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not it's not gonna an easy fix for anybody. Yes. Yeah. And, and I absolutely agree without, without case law. And it doesn't, this, this is the thing, right? Is um, we're not actually asking for um, a, a raft of successful cases. We would also benefit from unsuccessful cases because then it allows us to then understand what the legislation is really trying yeah. to. It interpretate, interprets mm -hmm. like the, in my world, you know, the words of what would a fair and reasonable employer do in the circumstances. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> so, yeah, I get what you're meaning. And the courts are doing it in my world because that legislation's been out since, um, you know, whenever, um, 2000. But uh, that's had a lot of years gone by and a lot of cases. But it changes. It goes backwards and forwards like a window wiper. And it's very confusing for people. Look, our, our judiciary system is probably where they should start, not, not actually here. Yeah. Hey, moving on. Um, there's some big stuff in the news in regards to your world. And, of course, Losing lives is really, really terrible. But when it comes to the education system, you know, you'd expect there'd be a lot of extra care there because the most precious resource we've got is our children. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that you brought to my attention. One's um, the first off you mentioned was um, the education department, and they have asbestos mm. in their in their classrooms. Uh, that worries me. Is that true? Is that what it, it came down to? Yeah, and and rightly so. Uh, I, I'm a, a father of five, um, uh, all of school age, and it's um, yeah, it is it is a, a scary um, uh, reality that many of our schools 
uh, do still contain asbestos containing materials. And uh, with the raft of new builds and renovations that are taking place across the country, um, there's a really big question mark around how that's being effectively controlled and managed um, at, at, at the, the coalface. What a horrible disease. You know, a, a distant uncle of mine, I watched him, loved the guy, really yeah. terrific, a builder. And he died very, very, uh, it was a horrible death, um, not being able to breathe and suffocating most of his life, carrying around a bottle of oxygen, just trying to survive. And to get to his letterbox was hell on earth. Um, so, you know, it, it's awful. But to know our children could be susceptible, yeah. wow. Uh, yeah. The government department letting us down in a big way. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. It's troubling to read the stories. So, um uh, I believe it was RNZ that ran a, a number of stories just in recent days um, in regards to um, suspected uh, asbestos exposure as, as situations in in the school um, uh, in the school grounds. So it, it kind of it comes back to um, ineffective planning um, both at the front end of the project, uh, but also at the back end. Um, and what I mean by that is is appropriate emergency response planning. Um, it sounds like uh, many of these companies had no uh, appreciation of what uh, it meant to be exposed to asbestos-containing materials, and uh, subsequently it's caused um, a whole heap of um, unnecessary um, stress and worry and concern for, for everybody involved. Um, it sounds like some of the, the headmasters have been considering uh, leaving the profession altogether because of the experience that that's, um, they've encountered. Well, some 20, 25 years ago, um, I was in charge of health and safety. So up in the Civic Building, this is for Auckland Council, mm -hmm. somebody drilled a hole in the wall and then somebody came and said, hey, there's asbestos in there, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. So I, we had to report it because we have to. That's, again, it's a, lead, it's a requirement that a lot of people don't know. So we reported it. Well, the whole floor had to be shut down, evacuated, people out of there quickly. Line it up. Plastic, it was put everywhere. There was complete emergencies, people in breathing gear coming in. And all it was a tiny little hole, you know, about the size of my finger mm -hmm. in the wall, you know, exposing people to um, asbestos. But yes. Emily, I don't know if that's overkill or it's real, but it's pretty mm -hmm. potent stuff. Yes, yeah. So there's, there's different grades of asbestos uh, materials. So there's there's um, uh, blue asbestos, which is uh, among some of the very worst, and then uh, other types of asbestos, which poses very little threat. Um, but again, it all comes back to the planning, right? So um, uh, what you've just described, it sounds like there wasn't much planning uh, in place and perhaps a bit of an overkill in terms of the response. Um, but this also boils back to education and awareness. Um, I'm really fortunate, um, in, at least on one hand, where I lived through the Canterbury earthquake uh, recovery program. And during that, there was a raft of upskilling and training opportunities for the construction sector and the health and safety uh, community. And so um, as a result, I've got a, a really good handle on what appropriate asbestos management and response looks like. It seems that perhaps that information and knowledge hasn't been shared very effectively across the country. And as yeah. a result, we're, we're seeing these types of cases uh, within our schools. Yes. And look, I, I look, can you blame teachers, principals, people like that? No, because it's not something that's high in our media or, or discussed very much anymore. It used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're managing it reasonably well, but there are some buildings. By the way, that building I'm referring to now is completely isolated. Somebody bought it to com convert into apartments, um, and I, it's still empty. I, I, I think it is anyway. But they were going to rip out all that asbestos and do it again, which would have been a heck of a cost. Getting back to it, um, wow. So that's the education department. But you gave me another very good story, which I can relate to. I saw it in the press, mm -hmm. and that's where a school was prosecuted. Um, they lost one of the students in a cave. I mean, lost, died. Mm -hmm. Um and am I correct in saying that the school was negligent? Well, it's it's still um, so it's it's due to go to trial. So the um, the the school board have been charged by WorkSafe just in the last twenty four hours um, failure to um, uh, provide a safe environment for their students. So the the board have been charged under um, this section within the act which relates to the PCBU so they've failed mm -hmm. as a, uh, a duty holder to well uh, have been accused to have failed to um, provide a safe environment for their students and for their teachers on the day 
So it, it's, it's an interesting one, and it's certainly a story that's going to be important to follow, um, because this could set a precedence in terms of the responsibilities of um, uh, uh, board members within the school sector, but also board members um, uh, across the land. So this this is one to watch. You know, I'd love to know some more detail on that because um, in my world, 20 odd years ago back at council again, if there was an event on, I'd have to insist that there was a plan for health and safety. Mm -hmm. So, yes. for example, a cycling you know, race going through the city, um, the traffic management plan had to be specified um, were there, um, you know, um, uh, first aid people handy in case there was an accident, injury? Was there um, people, could they be ex exited? There was all sorts of things that mm -hmm. probably an expert could probably think of, but the the organisers were duty bound. Mm -hmm. I, in terms of the overseeing the whole thing from a, a council perspective, had to ensure that those people were um, responsible and also accountable for doing it because I wanted to see their plan and so on and so forth. Does that all still happen still? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great example, Max. And um, one that's fresh in my mind is just over this weekend, we had the Open Christchurch event, which um, myself and my team uh, provided health and safety assistance too. So um, in terms of planning, gosh, we had 50 plus locations, 12,000 visitors um, throughout the oh. city. Um, and it involved a great deal of planning, um, um, thinking through the what ifs and ensuring that um, there was uh, adequate supervision and oversight during the weekend itself. It sounds like a lot, but actually in, in practice, because we had the systems uh, and we had um, uh, appropriately trained uh, uh, management team members, it was a breeze and the event went off with a bang. It was a really big success. So going back to this particular case with the caves, it, it will all come out to pass in, in, in the court and we'll find out the, the full details, but it's certainly suggestive of the fact that there was inadequate planning uh, leading up to the event and certainly a very serious lack of capability and planning on the day of the event as well. Um, the fact that there were parents who refused to let their children uh, attend the day because they saw the forecast and knew what those caves were capable of suggests that there was a serious lack of awareness um, leading up to that day. So still to be tested in courts, um, an awful scenario. And the, the thought of sending one of your children to school and them not coming home at the end of the day is just awful. Um, and I think there'll be some uh, very important lessons to come from it. Yeah, because public sentiment's going to have a big effect on the courts. And I've just been <laughs> listening to something else on um, online. A, uh, and evidently our highest court in the land do take into consideration public sentiments, particularly in murder cases. But getting back to it, that that will be very, very interesting because was there a plan in place? Who was in charge? Was there somebody experienced enough to understand the re re repercussions of, of um, you know excessive water and flooding coming in? Those sort of factors came in. And also, I what Floods, to my mind, is floods. That's a word, but mm. certainly the the Thailand situation where yes. um, those kids were blocked off um, mm. and actually had to go underwater to swim out. You know that and, and unconscious. But th those things are highest on my mind. And, yeah. and the, the the thing is, did the questions come to the school's mind, mm. or to the principal, or the organisers? Because yeah. I wouldn't go into a cave without some uh, experienced person. So yeah. someone must have known and would have known those risks. I hope. I hope. But if yes. they didn't, I think the school should be should be liable. Yeah, and again, that's a, a really good example of um, uh, helping to define what reasonably practicable really looks like. So um, uh, whether it's industry specific news and information, or whether it's a global press story like that, those children that were stuck in the cave in, in Thailand, all of that. Um, plays a part in what the uh, decision makers should have some awareness of and, and to help them to then decide whether it's safe to proceed or not. Well, for the sake of our viewers, you said some words there, two of them, mm -hmm. two words, uh, What? well, three, what's reasonable, pra reasonably practical? And what um, probably the viewers don't appreciate is mm -hmm. that applies to across the board on health and safety. Mm -hmm. And what is practical is a big question mark. And those mm -hmm. words are used regularly in there. And is there a definition in the act for that? Yes, there, there is. Um, uh, for, for a, a layman um, a breakdown of what, what it really means is um, being aware of what 
good looks like within your industry. So what are your industry peers um, doing to, um, to effectively control and mitigate the risks that your your operations create mm -hmm. um thinking through what are some of the suitable controls to reduce those risks and then the very last part of that equation must be from a legal lens the um the price point um that has to be the final decision making uh piece of the puzzle often what we see is businesses make a financial decision long before they think through what are some of the suitable ways to reduce those types of risks so it is a real education piece and you're absolutely right in terms of what reasonably practicable means it should be on the tip of every business leader's tongue but unfortunately due to the lack of information education um provided by the regulator provided by industry um people are still very much so scratching their heads it's a hard one because in your world it really is difficult you know i remember a person making a complaint in that same building I'm talking about, that the sun was was um, unsafe for her. Even though she had a, a blind, she could have shut down beside her desk. Mm. Um, but she felt that, that that was actually causing her degree of harm. Now, mm. you've got to investigate that, and you've got to come up with a practical, mm -hmm. what was your word? What, what's practical solution? Or, yes. or you know, what, what, what my responsibilities yeah. were practically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the air you breathe, I'm, it's not getting cleansed enough, the air conditioner's not working well. I mean, I had uh, all these weird and wonderful things thrown at me. So you've got to make a judgment call in your area of responsibility and tell me, like, even you, mm -hmm. in your world, can you personally be sued? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so could I in that role. Yeah. Yep, definitely. So, um, and you know, I mean, we, we, I'm sure that you're the same. We have our um, insurances and our, our, our personal indemnities and all of that good mm. stuff. But I guess at the end of the day is, um, yes, that is a risk that um, I am prepared to take because I've I've done my homework. Um, I've, I've gone and done my schooling and spent a great deal of time keeping up to date with the latest. So it's all part of that, what's reasonably practicable. Um, but possibly just as importantly as knowing my my lane and sticking to it. So well, that's the difficulty because if you you're engaged by employers to give you give them advice, but if you say to them oh, cotton wool, you need cotton wool, you need to wrap everybody in it, and you need to put them over it, and they're going to go, God, he's gone. Yes. No more money from us. He's finished. Yep. So, but then also you've got to go. Well, look, no, you, you want them to walk across a tightrope to the next office, across mm -hmm. you know, three stories up. Yep. No, that's not actually quite safe. It's, well, you might you might at least have a safety harness, but yes. something like that. But I mean, you've got to re you've got to resolve it practically. And mm -hmm. those decisions that you and advice you're giving mm -hmm. leaves you vulnerable to um, legislation. Now, that, that that segues on to another point we were just about to talk about was mm -hmm. the courts are dealing with this guy who blew himself up in a tank. I think he was welding mm -hmm. in a tank which had hydrocarbons in it. Now, I know a bit about hydrocarbons. I used to work in the um, in the oil industry. But you get um, a rusty tank, you need to get rid of it. So you chip it out. And But welding, you don't do it unless you purge the tank, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to go to a lot of trouble. Um but Emily, this guy blew himself up. Um, did he die, Matt? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, it was a, a fatal, a fatal case. Yep. But the employer, private employer, like he's not a government department, mm -hmm. is in the gun. So, do you want to explain more what the courts are talking about? Yeah. So, um, uh, WorkSafe um, they successfully prosecuted the company owner um, for um, failing to provide a, a safe work environment for this contractor. Um, from all accounts, uh, the contractor had not been fully uh, advised uh, of the fact that there was still some uh, accelerants in that uh, that tank, uh, and subsequently that, that event took place. So WorkSafe was successful in their prosecution. However, since um, the um, New Zealand police have uh, launched their own investigation and have begun the process of taking um, the property of the uh, the business owner as part of their investigation and uh, making all the noise that that is possibly the start of the process and that they could actually be um, taking a, a, an awful lot more of property, including vehicles, plant equipment, um, houses um, that belong to that business owner. So somewhere along the line, since the WorkSafe prosecution, the police have um, become very interested in the actions and behaviours of this business owner. So it certainly suggests that perhaps the business owner 
and their actions post the case uh, have really um, annoyed and upset the, uh, the the police. Well, I, I think I should explain something, um, folks. When, when Matt said that um, they were taking goods for the for the purpose of investigation, mm. it actually was more than that, wasn't it, Matt? Actually, they were taking it as compensation and and mm. taking off them yes. as assets because they have mm. the powers to do it under a different mm. piece of legislation. Mm. So I know that with gangs, for example, they can actually mm. go in and take off take their assets off them. Yeah. Um, and I think they're talking about reinforcing that even further. But mm. getting to this, wow, mm. that means that every employer is at risk of having their business taken off them. Not only that, their assets, their home, their everything, mm -hmm. if they fail in their duty of responsibility here. Yeah. Man, yeah, he must so. have been he must have reached it pretty seriously for to undertake that sort of experience. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So I've, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm privileged in the fact that I've, I've got access to people and individuals within, um, within WorkSafe and and other um, sectors who have have shared a little bit more information about the story. Unfortunately, I'm not really privy to speak to it, other than saying that perhaps some of the public statements and some of the behaviours that have been noted by the authorities since the um, the WorkSafe prosecution have. have inspired some of this um action to be taken but yeah it certainly should be uh, uh seen as a bit of a warning uh to business owners across the land uh that um despite findings in um in court uh your behaviors are still very much uh taken into account even after um a, a prosecution or uh, or otherwise um so i mean in terms of the application of this particular piece of legislation i'm not sure if it, that's what its intention ever was and you're quite right i think it was more steered towards um uh, gangs and towards uh unsavory characters and behaviors such as that um so it is very interesting to watch this roll out and whether the legislation will remain in its current form after this is is anyone's guess again it's a very interesting well Matt, you know point. even in your world i mean i wouldn't want your job <laughs> if that comes to the point where uh, you could lose that piece of uh, hardware that you're sitting in right now that probably you're in your home or your office right now that's it's right. rather daunting and and that's a huge responsibility to have but let's hope there's some extreme circumstances in this mm -hmm. that go way beyond what you and i may even because another thing within the act isn't it recklessness so that yes. means you you um you maybe just didn't get around to it or you couldn't be bothered or um, maybe you just turned a blind eye to something and you shouldn't have. Those things are reckless where they're not deliberate and that could be accidental. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think, I mean, I guess what what allows me to sleep easy at night is um, when it comes Insurance. down. Insurance? <laughs> well, a little bit. It, it, yeah, I mean, that definitely helps. But um, also, um, what, what are my motives and, and what is my intent? Uh, and so I think possibly to help steer people in the right direction is um, what, what could I have morally, ethically um, uh, done differently or when I'm taking on board some difficult, challenging decisions, um, really thinking through what are the, the what ifs and, and who, who else is impacted by the decisions that I make. And having um, open, honest dialogue with some of those stakeholders, I think that perhaps steers people in a, in a good direction. So rather than just simply putting the blinders on and going, I think this and let's just give it a punt, is is just being a bit more transparent uh, and thinking about, okay, who else is impacted by the decisions I'm making today? Perhaps I should have a conversation with them as well. Do you know, Matt, you, you um, give me... Um because I deal with employers and I, I can relate to what Brooke is saying that um, mm. the, the, the act is getting a little bit over cautious and perhaps people are actually spending, having to spend forcibly having to spend a lot of money on taking precautions. Mm. But I'm just hearing you right now. Um, you imagine if this case is successful and the, the realities of the situation are not told. So a lot of people will go, my God, I could be sued personally and lose my home and my family, uh, and, and I'm put in jail for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, that will have an impact when people are overcautious again and look at the New Zealand already, our productivity levels are at the lowest of the low uh, in the whole of the OECD. Mm -hmm. I mean, how we can't afford it, let alone... That, but what I'm saying to you is the incentives by this 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 piece of um, court work, mm. and 
what we're talking about and the over being over cautious mm. is is to actually say to employees, you've got to do it. Keep that paperwork. Do this. Do that. Do that. And spend hours and hours and hours preparing for that event before mm. you get onto it. And the costs just get up to where it's impractical. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's trying to, I guess, it, get that balance. Yeah, it's trying to find the balance. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, trying to move from theory to practice and being able to demonstrate to businesses of all shapes and sizes that, um, and it is good business practice is doing the planning well at the front end because i'm just thinking in, in my space I, I deal with a lot of um uh, construction and contractor management um type organizations and businesses across the land and um one of the the key things for them is getting the planning stages right at the front end and that has a flow on effect for the rest of the project and and greatly enhances a um, a positive outcome for all um meeting those um those milestones and meeting those deadlines when it comes to handing the keys over to the property owners. Um, but it is, it's trying to find that balance. Um, and do you know I, what would come to mind, Matt, is is the one that us Aucklanders would shudder at and look, um, where are you based and uh, uh, so, where? Yeah, so I'm based down in Christchurch these days. Yeah, uh, Christchurch. Yeah, so yeah. what we see is in Auckland is cones everywhere, cones, yes. cones, 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 and why they're there. And then people stopping you in your mm. car. Mm -hmm. And then pedestrian crossings with massive humps now and met lights, mm -hmm. and they're spending millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Why? Because mm -hmm. the the road builders and everyone going say, we didn't do it. We just got the health and safety specialist to do it, yes. and they're spending public money because they get paid per per cone that's out there. Mm -hmm. And it's not our doing, folks. <laughs> Jeepers, yeah. I got to say that seems to be overkill at the moment. You go to Australia, yeah. you don't see the cones that we see here. You yeah. go to other nations, there's no cones, but it seems yeah. like. There is an overzealousness of of applying yeah. health and safety for sure. Yeah. Oh, I totally, hate to be yeah. in your role. Good, oh, no, brave mean, it's, man, it's, very brave yeah. man. It's it's so much easier to slap a poster up or throw a traffic cone at the problem, right? Um, look, I, I agree. I agree with you. I think it's absolute overkill, and it gets to the point, And I suspect it's probably the case now, anyway, is that it becomes ineffective because you just see orange everywhere, and it means nothing anymore. Um, it's really interesting. Like, there's there's some really neat studies taking place in Europe where. Um, some of the major cities have chosen to remove all signage and all controls from some of the most busiest intersections within their city centres. Um, obviously, with a bit of pre-warning to the public, wow. um, the um, the outcome has been the complete opposite to what many feared would happen. They've actually become the safest um, spots within their cities because people are more aware of um, what uh, the consequences of bad behaviours is. And so people are more cautious, the speeds are slower, pedestrians are actually getting across the streets um, safer, um, incidents have just dropped through the floor, and it's like, oh, th there's something in that. So it is all about finding that balance um, and what is right for New Zealand. Um, may not necessarily be right for what's happening in Europe, but um, I agree with you. And I, I, I a, a, a warning sign for me or a big red flag when I am first introduced to a new business is if I go through their documentation and find a raft of policies and procedures which are all sitting on shelves gathering dust because the person that wrote them has subsequently moved on and no one else has read them to me that's that that's actually exposing that business to potential um legal problems because if it's written down and they're not um, applying it um they're failing to meet their duty and so i take great pleasure in helping organizations to take an axe to a lot of um, over overburdening some unnecessary paperwork um, because the, the legislation isn't actually requesting or requiring businesses to have a raft of documentation. It's really just trying to make sure that businesses have what is appropriate for the size, scale, and risk profile of that organization. And that's that's really what we do. And what a breath in. of fresh air that was. I hear that. <laughs> I'm actually telling people to get rid of their paperwork. <laughs> yes. Well, for a health and safety guy, you're out, you're unusual. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I could recommend you for on that basis <laughs> alone. Hey, look, just, just an old one, but old people will understand this, but I was talking to a friend of mine who's been in the oil industry, you know, at, in the hard end of the oil industry drilling um, mm -hmm. for many, many, many years, decades, decades, 40 odd. Anyway, he was telling me in the old days, people we go on to site and they were dangerous. Even though I worked up in the North Sea Oil with them, so uh, it was really you go on you go onto the drill floor and they used to throw the chain and 
people are exposed, no safeties or anything like that. Yeah. But he said we didn't have that many accidents. Yet occasionally someone would lose a finger. That was mm-hmm. that was occasionally, but yeah. otherwise they wouldn't. Why? Because they were alert all the time. Behind them, there's there's a big pipe getting pulled up by the crane that's going to be over there. We've got to put it on, and mm-hmm. then the chain's thrown around it and tightened it up with a chain, and the chain could break. So just back back a bit. You took precautions all the time through your intuitive ways. But what he was saying is today you put somebody on the drill floor Mm -hmm. and they walk around and goes, oh, no, no, I'll be safe. No, Mm -hmm. it's all done for me. No, I don't have to worry about that. It's it's done. And so that relaxed feeling. Yes. Yeah. Do you agree that's part, that is a scenario? Uh, Yeah, I I do. I do. And and it's, again, it probably seems contradictory coming from a health and safety professional, right? But um, I look back. Uh, I think you described it before very well. That <laughs> intersection. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and I, I, I really enjoy. Uh, it makes me very nervous, but I enjoy occasionally watching those black and white movies of um, the men running up the chimney stacks to do the uh, the annual repairs of the chimney stacks, or um, <laughs> the, the guys running across the steel girders in the middle of. Oh. Um, York, you know, having their lunch with their legs yeah. dangled over the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, obviously, it, it's it's probably predates um, the statistics that um, we, we now uh, maintain. But there has to be a, a, a discussion around the fact that I suspect the injury and fatality rates were significantly less in, in those industries than where they probably are these days. What changed? What happened? Um, and there's some social factors. I mean, um, the the workplace has changed. The nature of work has changed. Like where before, we had state owned enterprises which employed thousands of people, and you pretty much once you were employed, you were there for life. And so um, that was your bread and butter. And now we've got mm-hmm. far more um, uh, uh, transit people. Yeah, yeah, people that are just literally rocking in for a few weeks and then they disappear and find another job somewhere else. Um, education's changed, that the, the whole um, uh, society's changed. And I've, I think that has certainly had a, a part to play in, in the, um, the, the the way work works now. But I have to say that, um, and again, uh, it comes back to the, the um, overarching or overbearing bureaucracy, and we do need to challenge it. Um, I, I guess my, my it brings us right back to our discussion around uh, Brooke Van Belden's position, uh, in part, I agree with what she's saying. I just have concern that the the Health and Safety at Work Act hasn't really had a full opportunity to be put into place and, and to be tra- tested. And instead, um, I think we possibly should be focusing our attentions and energies in the education piece and the education role that the regulator once had. Um, and uh, the fact that it hasn't produced the promised guidance material over since you know over a decade uh we're still referring to guidance material that refers to the previous act um there's there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and i just i I worry that we're changing for the sake of changing um and perhaps people like myself um, and my opinions probably need to be aired a bit more as well um and, and to help empower businesses rather than robbing them of the opportunity to really look hard at what it is they do and how they can um effectively control it Good on you, Matt. Uh, mm-hmm. I look, there's a lot of home truths that you've spoken today, and I really is refreshing to hear somebody who's got a practical outlook mm-hmm. on health and safety rather than actually imposing an overzealous look at it. And mm-hmm. and of course, and of course, you also are very much aware that you personally are liable if if you are a bit reckless. So you've got to balance it off. Mm-hmm. Hey, how do they get in touch with you? Because I think a lot of people want to um, probably need someone like you and your team to come mm-hmm. in and have a look at their business. Yeah, thank you, Max. Um, so I'm on online. You can find Advanced Safety at advancedsafety.co.nz. Uh, I'm also very uh, prevalent on LinkedIn. So um, if you are a user of LinkedIn, you can find me, Matt Jones, Advanced Safety, uh, where I'm posting two or three times a day uh, and providing as much advice and insight as I can. All right. Well, I'll, um, I'll, after this, I'll put the link up onto the screen so people mm. can see it and we'll put it down below. Hey, thanks very much, Matt. Good to see you. And let's have another chat sometime. I really enjoyed that. All right. Sounds good. My pleasure. Thanks, Matt.